Welcome to a closer look with Mark Miller and Mark Shine. And last week, Mark, we made the switch from football to basketball. We even moved our chairs around, but we got a little bit of football business to finish up yet because we were lucky enough to have three local teams, all from the MAC Conference, play in the state championship in Columbus last week. And we want to review that just quickly. And I'll start with Coldwater in Division Five. They finished the record, their season at 13 and two because they lost in the final this year after winning four in a row and beating this very team the last two state championships, Canton Central Catholic. It happened on a 55-yard touchdown pass with just 58 seconds left in the game. That's their eighth final in a row. They lose 18 seniors, including names like Toby, Muhlenkamp, Klosterman, Seafring. Boy, some great players. Coach Chip Otten has never coached at Coldwater as a head coach and not gone to the state championship. He's lost 24 seniors last year and was back there again this year. So, Mark, I think it's a typical case that Coldwater will reload. And you've got a championship ring in your family. Um, yes, I do. Okay. Uh, uh, you caught me off guard. Yeah. Just for a second. My <laughs> uh, niece's son, I guess that's my great nephew, he was the offensive left tackle. Uh, Seafring made a very agonizing day for my, my relative <laughs> because he went around him several times. But yes, he was an offensive tackle All on right. that team. Thank well, congratulations. Yes. Let's move on and look at Marion Local and what the Flyers did now in their state championship game. They won their ninth state championship. They're now 63-10 and 10 in the playoffs by defeating uh, Cuyahoga Heights 21-17 before almost 6,300 people. Uh, four turnovers were the negative for the Flyers, but Ligers had a great game, rushed for 113. Toby had six catches for 95. They outrushed and out, outscored their opponent, obviously, by four, outrushed them by about 90. Congratulations to Tim Goodwin and the Marion Local Flyers. Let's look at Division 7. Minster went down there. They played Warren JFK, and you heard uh, Garen Stokes say they were a really, really good team. I saw the highlights. They were a really, really good team. They lost 24 6. Finished at 10 and 5. Remember, they won the 2014 state championship. Had another great playoff year in 2015. This year, they start two and four, and everybody says, "Ah, Minster's down." Then they won eight in a row and went to the state championship. What a year! Niemeyer, Hulsman, Smeezing, a lot of other guys played really well for them this year. Coach Garen Stokes, three straight years of great playoff runs, and they only lose eight seniors. Yep. Heads up, Mac Conference. They could be right back at you next year, Mark. Six out of seven divisions in yep. the state championship won by parochial schools, so the debate continues. Yeah, it? it does, and we're going to deal with that all along. And, hey, you know what? Just get better as a team and play and forget about what, what parochial or private or whatever. Just get better and play. All right, now we are actually are going to switch right. over to basketball, and we're going to review some of the top games from last weekend. And let's start with the games that we were at, the tip-off classic. You yeah. got Friday night. Well, Friday night, I think what we saw out there, first of all, Lima Central Catholic and Shawnee, and a really, really good performance in game one by Shawnee. They win 69-55. Good pressure defense. Sean McDonald was outstanding. So was Thomas Williams for Lima Central Catholic, and they've got a future, I think, through the T-Birds. In the second game, Elida beats Bath 59-46. Great perimeter shooting. Six different players for Elida made a three-point field goal. The junior class from Bath, Harrison Golf, Chad Fry, Will Clark, they're coming. They're going to be good players before long. Daniel Unruh, great game for the uh, Elida Bulldogs on Friday night. All right, I got Saturday night. And in the uh, consolation game, Bath and LCC matched up. It went overtime. They both got a lot better. Bath 62, LCC 56. It's a matchup of six foot eight junior centers that both had good games Friday and Saturday night. Bass point guard Chad Fry had 23 points, and Thomas Williams, to go along with that Friday night 20 rebounds, had another 18, a 38 rebound weekend. That's unbelievable. Tom Janowski, the big guy from LCC, 23 points, 11 rebounds. In the championship, Shawnee wins 65 over Elida's 55. Elida had a slim lead going into the fourth quarter, and then a 19-0 run by Shawnee caused that celebration right there. Sean McDonald averaged 19 points a game, and Tyler Moore came off the bench on Saturday to get 12. Daniel Unruh, back-to-back -back nice games, 22 points. And Mark, they presented the trophy to the winner. You can see part of the, the celebration right there. I, I think a really positive thing that Dave Evans and his staff chose to do at Elida, and that is to name the championship trophy after Dave May. Obviously, Dave was a part of the tip-off classic from its inception back in its very first year. I was very glad to see that, and congratulations to Shawnee, obviously, but especially, I think, for Nate Trophy after Dave May. Yeah, that's great. Yep. 
All right, you got St. Well, Henry let's and move on to some other games last weekend. We're going to go with uh, St. Henry and Spencerville. Uh, those are some teams that graduated, some people from a year ago, but really nice balance scoring from St. Henry. Lutmer gets 12, eight players scored. The team made nine three-point field goals. 27 out of their 49 points came from outside the arc, but Spencerville with a 56-49 win. Bailey and Griffin Croft combined for 16 points in the post. They're two big guys. Dak Pritchard had 22. He made a couple threes. Good balance from Sherlocky and Corso. A nice win for Spencerville at home against uh, St. Henry. We're going to look at a local matchup, Van Wert and Lincoln View. Lincoln View comes away 63 to 60 over the bigger division, Van Wert. Van Wert plays their first four games on the road. Tough start. They have a very young team that will make it tougher even yet, but their junior point guard, Jacoby Kelly, will lead them. Lincoln View, of course, coming off that 27 and 2 state runner up year last year. They only returned one letterman. They lost a lot, too. He's junior Caden Ringwald. A good start for Lincoln View and Van Wert on the road again this week. Let's take a look at Wayne Trace in Columbus Grove. A tough opener for, uh, for Chris Souter to take his new Columbus Grove team up to Wayne Trace because they are loaded with good players and especially with Ethan Linder for Columbus Grove. Roney with 15, Flores with 12. Roney also had uh, five assists and four rebounds. Nice game for Reese. But Ethan Linder, 41 points. He made four three-point field goals. You guard him on the three-point line. He goes to the basket. He made 13 free throws during the course of the game. Uh, Spadler had 14 points, including three three-point field goals. So good start for a very good Wayne Trace team as they defeat Columbus Grove 70-56. All right, it's time for our plays of the week. And Mark right. Shine's got a couple. We're going to learn the flex offense. We're going to learn the flex offense. This is one of my favorite offenses. It's a little bit out of vogue now, but it's one of my favorite offenses because it allows so many kids to touch the basketball and do so many different things. This is Bath is going to run a couple of sets with this. And we're just going to kind of get it started here and watch them get going here. The point guard picks a side. Throws the ball to a post, we get a baseline cut, then we get a pass to the free throw line, the thing repeats on the other side of the floor, and there's our jump shot from the free throw line. This is a great offense for people to learn because all five players touch the basketball, all five players learn to set screens and accept screens, you get a lot of free throw line jump shots and a lot of back cuts for layups. Here's that down screen going to take place right here, and there's the jump shot from about 15 feet for Bath. That's an excellent job of running that offense. I think it's a really good offense, especially for developing players. And then we're going to look at uh, a, a taking a charge. And how do you go about doing that? Well, watch number 25 here. That's Skylar Smith for Elida. He gets down the floor. He's going to get himself set. He gives the defender or the offensive player a chance to make a move. But when he doesn't do that, he runs right over him. He's set. No movement side to side. That's a really nice job by Skylar Smith. And that's what taking a charge is all about. All right, our bright spot this week, we're back at the Tip-Off Classic in the Elida Fieldhouse, and the Elida students having a little bit of fun. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, uh, they dress up, they have, we saw Moses parting oh, the yeah. student section on the other right. side. Well, this is Noah Wheeler, and Noah Wheeler is going to uh, be a swimmer, indoor swimmer, on the Fieldhouse floor. Here he is, he's getting ready, he was doing his, his uh, warm-ups a little while ago that um, reminiscence <laughs> of the, uh, the Olympics there. We, he's changing strokes. Here yep. we go. Got a little backstroke and he's getting worn out. So a buddy comes down and resuscitates him. That's always important to have a mask with you. So we enjoyed that. That was right in front of our broadcast table and they repeated it for us so we could get it on film. And that's the kind of fun that yeah. students are having at the tip off. That was a bad. That was a great time. And Mark, that's what high school basketball ought to be all about. Yeah, we got kids out on the floor competing and that's a positive thing. But when their classmates are out there, having fun. And I know it's kind of become a dress up thing now. It's, you know, it's Wild West week or it's Beach yeah. week or it's whatever it might be. I like to see those type of things among high school kids. Yep, that was great. All, All right. right, where are they now, Mark wow. Stein? Who are we looking at? This week we're going to look at Evan Eschmeyer. You remember the big guy from down at New Knoxville? Evan Eschmeyer, about 6'10 when he was in high school at New Knoxville as a freshman the 1990-91 season. He was second in the state history by making 75.7% .7 of his field goal attempts as a sophomore. He is second team All-Ohio as a junior, first team All-Ohio in 1993, averaging 29.3 points per game. He finishes, he currently is number seven in max scoring history. Then he goes on to the Northwestern University. The first couple years are leg injuries for him, so he ends up being on campus for six years. His final three years, he leads his team in scoring, rebounding, block shots, and field goal percentage. Goes on to a short career in the NBA. When he finishes, what's Evan Eschmeyer up to now? 
He gets a dual major, he do a degree in law, a law degree, and a business degree. He marries an honorable mention all-American basketball player, Kristen Deviak. Uh, they have twin boy, uh, twins, uh, Alexander and Elijah. They were born in 2007. Today, he is director of finance for Atlas Tower. They go around the United States and South Africa developing sites for cell phone towers, uh, radio and TV towers, those types of things. He's got a great post career, does Evan Eschmeyer. Still lives in Chicago. He's tall enough. He's like a cell there phone There he is. Tower. And you have some Evan Eschmeyer memorabilia. Yeah, one of the more famous games that Evan played in was down at Wapak, a district final. Mike Shep and I were broadcasting the game, and with less than a minute to go in their lead, they had a comfortable lead, he went up on a dunk and broke the backboard. I grabbed a chunk of the glass. It slid over by my feet, and I saved it all these years. And when Mark said he, said he was going to do Evan Eschmeyer, I brought my glass. This there is an go. actual piece of the backboard when F Evan Eschmeyer broke it. So that's good. What a that's great really player. A great he player. Yes, watch. he was. Hey, let's, let's go to a rule explanation. Okay. You're a former coach. You yep. are a current official. The question is, can you travel while inbounding the basketball? Right. I actually heard during a scrimmage yesterday somebody yell, hey, he's traveling when they're trying to bring the ball inbounds. Well, there's, there's two situations to deal with. First of all is live ball situations. Somebody makes a field goal. Somebody makes a free throw. You see that guy get to run the baseline perfectly legal. We're used to seeing that. What about dead ball situations? What about, you know, a guy travels, your team gets to take the ball out of bounds. We're coming out of a timeout, whatever, and your team gets to take the ball out of the bounds. You see that official point and say, spot. Can he travel? Well, the answer is no. He gets a three-foot space. As long as he has one foot in that space or over that space, he can do whatever he wants to do. He can do the Mexican hat dance. He can do whatever he wants in that space. He can actually go outside the space as long as he has one foot over top that three-foot space or actually in it. And that space goes all the way back to the wall or to the bleacher. So he's got a three-foot area all the way back. And then finally, if he does move outside that three-foot space, it's not traveling, it's a throw-in violation. So there's no pivot foot needed. No as pivot long as you're foot needed. The space. And again, my, my okay. favorite terminology is you can do the Mexican hat dance in there if you want, and it's perfectly legal. All right, there, there you, go. you go. All right. Well, a lot of great games coming up, yep. and we want to preview one, uh, some that we think are, are going to be uh, fun to watch. So you start off. All right, let's start out with Versailles and Delphi St. John's. Now, Delphi St. John's has not played a game yet. We know they have Timothy Krieger coming back, their 6'8 post player. We know Elwin, Aaron Elwood always does a good job with his team. We would expect them to have a good basketball team, but they have not played yet. This will be their opener. For Versailles, they played a couple games, and you go, why are they playing this league game a week ahead of everybody? The Versailles always starts their tournament in the Southwest District a week ahead of everybody else, so they have to finish their regular season a week ahead of everybody else. So the one league game this week in the MAC. Now, Versailles is 2-0. They're led by Justin Arns. He's a great player. He's just a junior, committed to Ohio State University. This will be a really good matchup. The interesting thing is the last four times these teams have matched up, the road team has won the basketball game. This game is at Delphi St. John's. DSJ has not won a game, home game. Neither team has won a home game in this series since the 2011-12 season when DSJ won by three. Let's see if the home team wins this weekend or Versailles gets a road win in the MAC. I saw Arns, the older Arns, play yeah. for Michigan State last night on TV. Pretty good player. All right, I'm going to look at Ottoville at Columbus Grove. Ottoville was just 3-20 last year, but they open up with a win over Temple, 74-65. They got their two scorers back. Logan Kemper, he had 25 last weekend, and Luke Moore, or Nick Mormon had 23. Those sophomores that they played with and struggled with last year are juniors now, so they look to have a much better year. Columbus Grove, new coach Chris Sauters, there in his first year after coming over from Ada. They lost to Wayne Trace Friday, 70 to 56. Reese Roney led them in with points, the, the big football guy. He had 14, and Grayson Flores, 12. Okay, and let's move on to Lima Senior in Toledo St. Francis. Don't know a lot about the Spartans right now. We know that Jar Ward is their lone returning starter. We know Keaton Upshaw is back, as so is Denesto Martin, and a lot of young guys who come into the program, so we're not sure exactly what we're going to see out of the Spartans. Who do they play? They're at Toledo St. Francis, who's 2-0, and and they have done it by playing defense. They beat Northwestern 53-39, uh, and last night uh, they had a win as well. That was over Toledo. Scott blew them out as well. They have an all-league point guard returning. That's Kenny Coleman Graham. He was first-team all-conference a year ago. Don't go to sleep on this one, Spartans. It's at Toledo St. Francis, and next week is a league game. You get Toledo St. John's at home. This is a big game for them on the road for the Spartans. Arlington at Lipsick in the BVC. Arlington beat Fort Jennings in overtime 61-58 last week. They're led by the same guy that led them in football, Logan Spire. 20 points, 9 rebounds. Lipsick, they beat Bluffton in overtime. So if it comes down to a close <laughs> game, they're both prepared. Grant Schrader had 16. Jordan Berger, 10-6. and six. 
New coach for the Lipsick Vikings, Chris Kuhlman. And SCL action, Jackson Center at Rushi. Two of the top programs in the conference. Rushi is a two and one right now. They have a, a couple of wins over Houston and Newton. They lost to St. Henry in overtime. Jackson Center's two and zero. Oh. They've defeated Lehman and Columbus Grove. Two opposite styles. Rushi wants to get it out, run up and down the floor. Jackson Center more control. Jackson Center's given up 38 and 28 in their two games. On one side, you got Deporte and Cordanier and Monier. Those guys. On the other side, you got Brady Wildermuth from uh, from Jackson Center. Really good matchup early on. They'll play again in January because both teams, they play everybody twice in that particular conference. Let's look at a Saturday night game. Ottawa Glandorf at Liberty Benton. Of course, OG was a, a co-champ last year in the WBL. They returned four Letterman. They got a late start due to football, so this will be their first game. Liberty Benton lost to Rossford. Another overtime game, 62-60. Austin May had 20, and they will play at North Baltimore on Friday, so they will have had two games before they play OG at all. Hey, let's put up the games that we've got on our broadcast schedule. Keep checking it because we got midweek games, we've got weekend games, got girls games, boys games, games coming at you all the time, all the way to Columbus. Pick out your favorite game and take a look. That'll do it for Mark and I. See you next week on A Closer Look.